Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Today is our um, eighth session. Today we are going to discuss about qualitative data analysis and the, the material will be presented by group two. And then I will add uh, some additional material at the end. And then uh, last but not least, we'll do a breakout session as usual to discuss about your final project. I think without further ado, I will let group uh, two to begin presenting their material. Can everyone see our PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, can you um, share, can you make it full screen, please? Uh, okay, much better. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. We are from group two. Uh, and today we will be covering uh, chapter four on qualitative data analysis. Uh, these are the members of the group. I think, yeah, I think someone's missing. Um, Fatoni has yet to write his name and student number. So there should be five people here. Sorry, uh, we will be covering chapter four, five, and six. So the first, uh, on chapter four, we're discussing on the fundamentals of qualitative, qualitative data analysis. And this chapter focuses on uh, the fundamentals and more specifically uh, on data collection process. The data collection uh, in this chapter, uh, it states that data collection should facilitate the researcher. Now, what that means is um, the data that the researcher collects, it should not uh, become a problem and it should not uh, be difficult for them to create a report, to, I guess, create a presentation and to uh, inform others of the result of the research itself. So, and that all starts from how they collect da the data. Uh, and that is why uh, in, this chap in this chapter, it is said that analysis should be concurrent with data collection. Uh, it is considered as the healthy corrective for, for built-in blind spot. Now, what that means is when a researcher is conducting a study, and they are collecting data. Uh, while they are collecting that data, they should uh, continuously uh, analyze it and study from it. Because what happens uh, way too often is that researchers will collect hundreds and hundreds of data, uh, compiling it into the, their computers. Uh, and they will only process it later on when they're going to prepare the report uh, when in reality, the analysis and the act of studying the data itself should be done while they are collecting it. Uh, so it will not be, I guess, like a burden uh, later on when they are preparing the reports. So as a method of studying and analyzing their data, and to make it, I mean, easier, I guess, in a way, is by using something called coding. So coding is the process of labeling and organizing data to identify different themes and relationships. And this is generally done by assigning labels to words or phrases that represent important and recurring themes. Uh, according to Saldana in 2013, uh, coding can be divided into two main stages, which is the first cycle and second cycle codes, which we will discuss uh, in this presentation. So the first cycle coding is the method of coding that initially assigns assigned to data chunks with a total of 25 different approaches. Uh, we will only discuss, like, I think there were there are 13 or 15 uh, to save time. So the first one is the elemental methods, which is the basic fundamental codes. And the first one is descriptive coding, which, uh, which are 
labels uh, of a data to summarize the basic topic of a passage of qualitative data. Uh, this is usually used for social environments, meaning like, let's say in an interview, uh, the participant gives a description of a certain area. Uh, we can give that we can give that uh, description a code. Let's say uh, in our interview with one of our participants for our group's uh, assignment, which was, which is about internship on academic achievement. Uh, our participant gave us a, a description of his workplace. Uh, and that description, we can code that as uh, giving it a descriptive coding. And secondly, and there's in vivo coding, words or short phrases from the participant's own language placed in quotation marks to differentiate from researcher-generated codes. Uh, so in vivo coding usually uh, looks at the transcripts of the interviews and as the uh, as it says words or short phrases from the participants own language so we take out uh, a certain word or phrase from that transcript as a code and third there's process coding which uses gerunds or words ending in ing to connote observable action in data And moving on, there is the affective methods, which are, which are more subjective to the participants themselves. Uh, the first one is emotion coding. Labels the emotions experienced by participant or inferred by the researcher about the participant. So as the name suggests, this uh, is more concerned about the emotion of the participants. This can be something that they uh, explicitly states in their answer during the interview, or it's something that uh, we, or as the researcher, uh, inferred from their statements. Uh, second is values coding, which reflects a participant values, attitudes, and beliefs, uh, and represents their perspectives or worldview. As you can see, uh, values, attitudes, and beliefs are usually shortened in the codes with the letters V, uh, A, and P. And then we have evaluation coding. And then we have evaluation coding, which applies primar primarily for uh, non-quantitative codes onto qualitative data. Uh, and it assigns judgments about the merit, worth, or significance of programs or policy. So uh, an example of evaluation coding would be in this uh, sentence, the arts agency did a great job at selecting qualified candidates this time around. Um, this can be coded as the number, the code number two, with a plus sign candidates colon qualified. Now, sorry. Now, uh, as we can see, the code itself uh, is made up of different parts. The first being the number itself, the, the number, the code number, the plus sign, which indicates a positive uh, relationship, uh, the, the code candidates, followed by the subcode qualified. Now, subcode, which will be explained later on, a, a subcode is, a, I guess, uh, a more specified, a more detailed, a more detailed version of a code. Uh, that makes it more refined. So <clears throat> it can be grouped later on. Sorry. Okay, uh, moving on, there is the literary and the language method, which there's only one, which is the dramaturgical coding. Uh, the dramaturgical coding applies the terms and conventions of character, play script, and production analysis on qualitative data. Uh, this is appropriate for exploring intrapersonal and interpersonal experiences and actions in case studies. Uh, and the example that we have included here is a passage. So I'm going to read the first sentence. There was a lot of pressure this year to do more with less, quotation mark, uh, and that always frustrates me. 
uh, and we can see that on the side, on the right side, sorry, on the right side, there is the code. Uh, the number one is a con with less resources. Uh, this is similar to the previous one, which was evaluation coding. That evaluation coding, um, this consists of uh, different parts. The, num the code number itself, the code con, which C-O-N, yes. The con, which stands for conflict, and then the subcode, less resources. And the following uh, codes are somewhat similar. For example, uh, emo, which uh, signifies emotion, followed by the subcode frustration. TAC uh, refers to tactics uh, with the subcode resistance. We have AWT, which stands for attitude, uh, followed by the subcode limitations. And then there is TAC, which is tactics, uh, followed by subcode sacrificing. Now, what this tells us is that there prob probably in the study, there are a lot, a lot of other passages that uses this code with C-O-N, E-M-O, T-A-C, A-T-T. And all of these are given smaller categories with those subcodes. There's less resources, there's frustration, resistance, and so on. And moving on to the exploratory methods, we have holistic coding. Uh, which applies a single code to a large unit of data in the corpus rather than line by line coding. So uh, basically holistic coding, if we refer to this uh, example, this whole paragraph would be coded, would be given one code instead of uh, per line. And then provisional coding uh, is when a study begins with a start list of researcher generated codes based on previous studies, uh, hypothesis coding, the application of a predetermined list of codes onto qualitative data specifically to assess a researcher generated hypothesis. Now, what that means is um, assume in a study, they have a hypothesis, a hypothesis uh, and the answer to the, to the hypothesis uh, there are two main answers that say yes and no. So the, they would have a predetermined code for a yes answer and a predetermined code for a no answer. That is basically the short, the gist of it. And then we have the procedural methods. Uh, the first one is protocol coding, which is it's coding of qualitative data according to a pre-established, recommended, standardized, or prescribed system. Now, the difference between um, protocol coding and the previous one, provisional coding, um, provisional coding is usually based off of a studies or previous studies or previous researches, but are not uh, mandatory. Like they, they are not uh, established, they are not standardized, but in protocol coding, um, these are codes that are followed by numerous studies for and numerous research researches because it is uh, something that's already established and agreed by uh, researcher, researchers everywhere. Like for example, I think the exam the case given in the book it was about a domestic violence and a pre-established code. That ex that is a um, what's it called a cause of uh, domestic violence is uh, alcohol abuse. So the code that they used for alcohol abuse is ALCOH, alcohol, uh, if you if you would, and that is a pre-established and predetermined uh, code for that term. That is used by that is already used by. Uh, lots of studies and researches. And moving on, we have causation coding, which extracts attributions or causal beliefs from participant data about how and why a, per a particular outcome happens. Uh, this type of code usually divides it into uh, three parts with, with 
joined by a uh, an arrow, an arrow sign. So we have a code one followed by followed by a an arrow sign that points to code two, and an arrow sign that follows followed by code three. Now, what this basically means is that um, the code one is the cause which leads to code two. And the code two is the cause that leads to code three. It's basically that. And then we have magnitude coding, which consists of supplemental uh, alphanumeric or symbolic codes or subcodes applied to existing coded data. Now, this example is already seen in a previous type of code. Um, sorry. Uh, it was here uh, on evaluation coding, where in that code they used the sign, the plus sign. And this is also a type of magnitude coding, where they use often numeric or symbolic codes uh, and apply it to existing coded data. Now, if, these are usually explained uh, in, the, in the first pages of the research and are not the same in uh, one set, from one study to another. It may vary. So creating and revising codes. Um, so how do we create codes? The first um, step would be to re refer to codes of previous studies, or I guess in a way, implement a, a provisional code where they look for uh, codes that already exist in previous re researches. So for example, if, um, in our research on internship towards uh, academic achievement, we referred to a previous study that um, covered on soft skills. Uh, in that study, they used codes uh, to they used codes um, to represent certain soft skills, like such as time management and uh, team skills and so on and so forth. So we can use those codes uh, in our own study. And the second one is to prepare a start list or using a deductive coding related to the conceptual framework, research questions and hypotheses. And so another option would be to uh, refer to our conceptual framework, our research questions and hypothesis to create our own codes, to make it easier um, to categorize these, uh, the potential information that we get from our interviews. Uh, and thirdly, that we can also insert new codes when needed or, or using inductive coding. So during our study, let's say during an interview, uh, the participant gives us a new information and we don't, we don't have a code uh, that fits that information, we can add a new code so uh, it can be grouped uh, inside that new code. And, la so, and lastly, some codes may need to be changed, removed or divided into subcodes. Um, so, so as I've mentioned earlier, uh, where we prepared a start list of codes, uh, some codes may not be used uh, because uh, participants' answers may differ from our expectations. So it sometimes it must be changed, it must be or removed, or sometimes a code uh, is too much, but there's too many information contained in one in a single code, so it must be. Uh, divided into smaller categories, or as we like to refer to it as subcodes. So for the second cycle coding, uh, where we uh, focus more on pattern codes, second cycle coding is the reorganization of the vast array of initial analytic details or codes from the first cycle into a smaller number of categories, themes, or constructs. So. Um, base, so basically, uh, if I were to give a simplified analogy, let's say in a transcript of an interview, in a transcript of an interview, uh, we, we would like to highlight key uh, information that the participant has mentioned. 
uh, that, would, that would be the first cycle. The second cycle would be grouping all of those highlighted uh, information uh, based on their similarity, based on the themes. So for example, if, for example, if this highlighted uh, sentence uh, is related to uh, topic A, we would categorize it into topic A. This other sentence uh, discusses on topic B, it would be categorized into subtopic B. And so pattern codes are explanatory or inferential codes that identify emergent themes or, conf or configurations. And pattern codes have these uh, four main functions. The first one is condenses large amounts of data into smaller units. As I've mentioned earlier, um, a code um, might have way too much information. So it needs to be subdivided. And the smaller units will be uh, grouped together using this pattern coding. And the second function is that it permits analysis during data collection so that later field work can be more focused. Uh, it helps elaborate a cognitive map for understanding local incidents and interactions. And for multi-case studies, it lays the groundwork for cross-case analysis by surfacing common themes, uh, by identifying patterns among uh, multiple cases, uh, as it states in the slides, it lays the groundwork so it doesn't go everywhere. So it's not a mess, basically. Okay, I will continue this presentation. Uh, the slide is about using pattern courts in an analysis. It may be useful at some point to map the pattern courts that is to lay out the component codes that that you pattern along with the segments from the field notes. It helps to do it visually in a network display seeing how the components interconnect. The mapping is a new take on the conceptual framework, although it is not hard to do this way. And mapping by computer and CACDES has some powerful advantage and does this well. Uh, the most promising codes to emerge from this exercise are written up in the form of an analytic memo that expands on the significance of the code. This process helps the writer become less fuzzy about the emerging category, theme, construct, and so on, and gets cross case and a higher level analytic energy flowing. This pattern court doesn't get discounted, but rather gets qualified. The conditions under which is called are specified, for example, the rule of no short talk in the launch can be done in case of conflict, crisis, or socializing of new members. If a general pattern code such as rules is used at a good deal, it is helpful to create subcodes that explain the content and enable easy retrieval. For the first one, uh, like rules in div, uh, it indicate the subcode of rules about individual participant behavior. Next, about rules public, it's the subcode of rules about behavior in public settings. And rules work is subcode of rules that specify how formal work tasks are to be carried out. Also, stay open to the idea of inventing new types of pattern codes. For example, we developed the pattern code Q, meaning a query about something surprising that happened in the case. Being surprised is an important event in the field work, and we want to track it in our notes. Finally, pattern codes get checked out in the next wave of the Hello? We cannot hear you. Hello? Uh, Fatoni has given up a uh, heads up. Sorry, I got disconnected. Okay, okay, no, no worries. You can continue. Uh, may I continue? Hello? Yes, yes continue from the last before you uh, lost connection. Uh, can I be heard? Yeah, uh, yes. Hello? 
Katoni, I think you're still muted. Sorry, sir. Uh, my you're not in my region is better. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, the next slide is. Yes, you can please continue. Uh, the first cycle coding of data generates an, an array of individual codes associated with the respective data chunks. Uh, in the first, the cycle codes transform into second cycle pattern codes and then get inserted into matrix and networks. Uh, select series of codes related to the first month of withdrawal symptoms described by a participant voluntarily participating in stopping smoking. And with the first cycle code, uh, we can see that there are anxiety, nervousness, hurt someone bad, restlessness, deep breathing, eating a lot more, wandering around, habitual movements, memories of smoking, and smelling new things. Uh, and those uh, those findings in the first cycle can be grouped by uh, three code type. The first one is emotions that contains anxiety, nervousness, hurt someone bad, restlessness, felt like crying and angry, and then process like deep breathing, throat burning, felt like crying, eating a lot more, wandering around, smelling new things. And the last uh, code type is descriptors, uh, which contain uh, habitual movements and memories of smoking. Next slide, please. Uh, since negative and strong emotions seems to play a critical role in withdrawal with symptoms from smoking, emotions as a pattern code choice makes sense. Uh, one can even enhance the code further with the adjective negative emotions. But for the process and descriptor labels, it lacks a, a pattern code. Uh, what is needed for a pattern code, which is summarize the categories or terms or cause or explanation relationships among people and theoretical constructs. Uh, there are several ways of recategorizing the remaining codes. First, by reassembling them into particular clusters because they seem to go together. The first cluster is uh, about uh, all upper body functions like respiratory, sensory, and digestive. So we can conclude that the cluster one uh, as a physical change that unifies them and thus get the pattern code assigned to them. Uh, for cluster two, uh, we can uh, categorize them as restless journey. And for cluster three, we can categorize them as regretful loss. Uh, the two labels of cluster two and cluster T is get uh, is gathered from the researchers' reflection on what their constituent codes seem to have in common. Uh, and, and in the final change, we have four pattern codes like negative emotions, physical change, restless journey, and regretful loss. Uh, all researchers reflecting on and clustering the first cycle codes might develop different pattern codes altogether. Thus, an important principle to note here is that pattern coding is not always a precise science. It's primarily an interpretative act. The researcher can now use the four pattern codes in various ways according to the needs of the study. Basic narrative description is one approach and visual display are another primary way of analyzing data in fresh perspectives. Next slide. And the first one is narrative description, where the researcher can compose a section that identifies and elaborates on the pattern code, weaving its component of cycle codes into the narrative and supporting its with uh, field not data. In this case, the storyline function of narrative enables the researcher to outline the post, uh, the plots of human action and how participants change throughout the course of study. Mosaic representation and presentation of our findings are essential, essential ways to communicate to readers how the social action we witness and synthesize unfold and plot to type and of the narrative description. And we can see the italic uh, phrase like restless journey and negative emotions indicate the quotes that we met during the second cycle code. Next slide. Uh, matrix display uh, chart the 
or table the data for analytic purpose. They organize the fast array of condensed material into an uh, reflection, verification, conclusion, drawing, and other analytic text. Uh, uh, the, this, uh, the this chart shows a uh, participant's data at one month and six months after quitting. Uh, the pattern codes are placed in one column and the related file cycle codes or other data summarizers are placed in the respective column. As informatics uh, enables the researcher to take in the silent findings of the analysis. For example, in the negative emotion straw, we can see that phenomena decreased across a six-month period, but anxiety is still present. Each cell of matrix doesn't have to include the kitchen sink of symptoms. only some of the most relevant exemplars from the coding and analysis. Next slide. Explaining about the coding advice. Uh, the first one is coding is uh, not something just to get the data ready, but it's a form of early and continuing analysis. It typically leads to a reshaping of the researcher's perspective and the information for the next round. And second one is remember that codes are more than a piling system. If a project needs a systematic way to store code field data and a way to retrieve the, uh, them in easily during analysis. Uh, and management and the thing is of the research lies in the researchers emerging map of what is happening and why so any method that will force more differentiation and integration of that map while remaining flexible is a good idea. Coding or the analysis can accomplish the goals. Uh, and last one is coding can be tiring. It often with jottings and analytic memos. Uh, this slide is about jottings and a jotting hosts the researchers creating and emerging reflections and commentary on issues that emerge during field work and especially data analysis. As the researchers work on a project, reflections of several sorts typically swim into awareness. For example, we can consider the, these following things. Uh, the first one is inference on the meaning of what a key participant was really saying during an exchange that seemed how, somehow important and then personal reactions to some participants' remarks or actions. 
and then what the relationship with participant feels like, doubts about the quality of some of the data, second talks about some of the interview question and observations protocols, a, pen, a mental note to pursue an issue further in the next contact, cross reference to material in another part of the data set and elaboration or clarification of prior incident or even that now seems of possible significance. Next slide. When something like any of these examples arise, it's useful to jot your mental note directly into field notes or somewhere else in the data corpus. It may or may not be a folder for a deeper analytic memo, but at least it's in print. One convention is to distinguish the remark with italics to signal that it is a different order from the data it comments on. Uh, jotting can straighten coding by pointing to the deeper or underlying issues that deserve analytic extension. Coding can become tedious if we treat your ourselves as a sort of machine scanning page methodically. We keep picking out small segments of data and assigning labels to them. The sensation of being bored is usually a signal uh, that we have ceased to think. And one way of retaining mindfulness in coding is by doing occasional jotting. Uh, as coding proceeds, if we alert about what we are doing, ideas and reactions to the meaning of what we see will well up steadily. These ideas are important because the ideas suggest new interpretations, lead and connection with other parts of the data. And we usually point towards the questions and issues to look into during the next wave of data collection. Jotting in the form of reference remarks can be added while we write or expand on a row of field notes. We can simultaneously aware of events in this site and of we, our own feelings, reactions, insects, and interpretation. Uh, and this one is the example of jottings where uh, the highlighted phrase be commented by the researcher during uh, the observation of the transcript of the interview. Next slide, please. Uh, an analytic memo is a brief or extended narrative that documents the researcher's reflections and thinking process about the data. These are not just descriptive summaries of data, but attempts to synthesize them into a higher level analytic meanings. There are first their self-reports about the study's phenomena and serve as the basis for more expanded and final reports. Memo can be developed among how you personally relate to the participants, your study research questions, your code choices, emergent patterns, categories, themes, the possible networks among the codes, patterns, and categories, themes, an emergent or related existence theory, any problems with the study, any personal or ethical dilemmas with the study, future directions for the study, the analytic memos generated, and the final report for the study. Next slide. Memos are typically a rapid way of capturing tools that occur throughout data collection, data condensation, data display, conclusion drawing, conclusion testing, and final reporting. Later in the study, memos can be more elaborate, especially when they piece together separate strands of the data or look across multiple measures of a construct. Analytic memos are primarily conceptual in intent. They don't just report data, they, they, they tie together different pieces of data into a recognizable cluster, often to show that those data are intents of a general concept. Analytic memo can also go well beyond quotes and the relationship into any aspect of the study. Uh, An analytic memo should be dated for reference to the analytic history and progress of the study, titled with its memo type, for the example, code definition, and subtitled with its more specific content, example, what case have in common. Most cactus programs can create and, and maintain memos, but they can also be kept as a running diary of sorts in a spare file. Next slide. Uh, for the own visual data, analyzing the visual has its own repertoire of methods, but we, uh, we don't go to the detail and we can see that what we see as still visual documentation, such as in a magazine, is more of a holistic venture than a systematic one. Analytic memoing of the impression about the captured image is a more appropriate form of exploration than detailed breakdowns of components. But the moving image uh, might rely on more traditional content analytic methods such as counts and categories for nuance analysis. Paradoxically, a picture is worth a thousand words, must content with images don't speak, don't speak for themselves. Uh, as the researchers, we must interpret the visual and determine whether the test merits analytic methods and strategies 
not applicable to language-based data. To the researcher, the visual has always been a vital part of fieldwork investigation. It is simply the forms and formats of visual data that have evolved over those decades. What's more important, we think uh, influence and effects of the digital visual culture on our participants. And for the memoing advice, the first one is prioritize memoing. When an idea strikes, stop whatever else uh, the researcher do and write the memo. Don't worry about post elegance or even grammar. Include the musing of all such, even the foggy ones. Give uh, the researchers the freedom to think and don't self-censor. The second one is memoing should begin as soon as the first five data start coming in and usually should continue right up to the production of the final reports. Memoing contributes strongly to the development or revision of the coding system. The third one is keep memo sortable, caption them by basic content. Like coded data, memos can be stored and retrieved using a wide variety of methods. The fourth one is memos are about ideas. Simply summarizing or recounting that example is not enough. The fifth one is don't necessarily standardize memo formats or types, especially in a multiple researcher study. Memo styles are distinctive and memo types are as various as the Im imagination can reach. And the last one is memo writing often provides sharp sunlight moments of clarity or insight. Uh, which can we said as little conceptual epiphanies. Next slide, please. Uh, this one is about assertions and prepositions. As a study proceeds, there is a greater need to formalize and systemize, systemat systematize the researchers thinking into a coherent set of explanations. One way to do that is to generate assertions and propositions or connected sets of statements reflecting the findings and conclusions of the study. Uh, an assertion is a declarative statement of summar summative synthesis, supported by confirming evidence from the data and revised when this confirming evidence, uh, for the example, is like the workers at some corporation were not self-motivated to achieve excellence. A proposition is a statement that puts forth a conditional event, an if-then or why-because proposal that gets closer to prediction or theory. For example, when employees work in a dysfunctional environment, their individual workplace skills may decay from lack of motivation to achieve excellence. Assertions and propositions are ways of summarizing and synthesizing a vast number of individual analytic observations. They are like bullet points of major patterns, themes, trends, and findings that we can feel uh, and we can confidently put forth about uh, our studies. These points can range from descriptive broad blast of facts to higher level interpretation about the meanings of the study. Next slide. For the example, uh, the researcher Nemkel conducted a multiple case study of the effects of computers on classroom instruction. At the first analytic meetings, for the researchers record the case specific assertions and proportion on index cards. The statement then when then were clustered thematically and evidence was shifted for each case. In the study, the propositions took the form of emerging hypotheses. The first hypothesis is teachers' preference for different software programs are greatly influenced by their theoretical oriented to reading. And the second one is individual learning and self-direction as well as cooperation and peer teaching are promoted to computer use. And some transfer of these learning styles to other class activities may occur. The degree of support of the proposition in each case was then rated as strong, qualified, neutral, and contradictory. After the next wave of data collection, which attended to missing data, the proposition was revisited. For a matrix with rows showing each teacher at each side, column entries include the data that support the proposition and the data that they didn't. As it turned out, the second proposition, which is individual learning and self direction are promoted through computer use, uh, wasn't supported. At the end, the propositions were tested further with other data search and cases that didn't fit the patterns were re-examined carefully. Next slide. Uh, now is about within case analysis and cross case analysis. In the within case analysis, the goal is to describe, understand, and explain what has happened in a single bounded context. Uh, and we can say that the case or the site. That is the test of traditional ethnography researcher whose effort is to emerge with a well-grounded sense of local reality, whether the focus is a family, a tribe, a former organization, or a company. 
one effect and the advantage of studying cost case cost case uh, cases is to increase generalizability and reassuring the researcher that the events and process in one well described setting are not well idiosyncratic at a deeper level the purpose is to see process and outcomes across many cases and one reason to conduct a cost case analysis is to enhance generalizability or transferability. Although it's argued that this goal is sometimes inappropriate for qualitative studies, the question doesn't go away. We would like to know something about the relevance or applicability of our findings to other similar settings. And the second goal of cost case analysis is to deepen understanding and explanation. Multiple cases help the researcher find negative cases to strengthen a theory will through examination of similarities and difference across cases. That process is much quicker and easier with multiple cases than with a single case. Next slide. And now it's about the difference between variable and case. Uh, case oriented approach considers the case as a whole entity, looking at configurations, association, costs, and effects within the case, and only then turns to comparative analysis of a number of cases. We would look for underlying similarities and constant associations, compare cases with different outcomes, and begin to form more general explanation. While the variable-oriented approach is conceptual and theory-centered from the start, casting a wide net over a large number of cases. The building blocks are variables and their interrelationships rather than cases. So the details of any specific case reset behind the broad patterns found across a wide variety of cases and a little explicit case to case comparison is done. Uh, for example, is a case oriented approach will consist of looking about six different families to observe how particular couples and single parents raise the children. Each parent will be interviewed to get his or her own family background, education, and so on, in addition to particular circumstances, such as ages, income, work, and child care schedules. Uh, these various and rich little family biographical profiles would then be compared for analysis, while for a variable oriented approach will consist of looking at like 50 families, a patient of different sample of structures like uh, uh, full parent, complete parents, and single parent, and then one step parent and one biological parent, foster parents, uh, etc. To, to observe and interview them about predetermined set of variables included under the main category of parent-child communication. For the example, like informal dinner conversation, direction and instruction, and discipline matters. A variable-oriented analysis is good for finding probabilistic relationships among variables in a large population, while case-oriented analysis is good at finding specific concrete, historically grounded patterns common to small sets of cases. Next slide. Uh, there are some different strategies that conducted for case-oriented analysis. The first one is replication strategy. Uh, it is a theoretical framework is used to study one case in depth, and then successive cases are examined to see whether the pattern found match that in previous cases. It's also useful to examine cases where the pattern is expected on a theoretical basis to be weaker or absent. And the second one is multiple exemplars. The issue is not so much analysis after the constructing pair conceptions of particular phenomenon. We can collect multiple instant and then bracket or isolate the relevant data passage, then inspecting them carefully for essential elements or components. The elements are then rebuilt into an ordered wall and put back into the natural social context. The third one is uh, forming types of families. Uh, for the example, is the researcher found the 61 lactating mothers fell into four groups, those who could uh, express milk, those who couldn't, those who perceived it as easy, and those who perceived it as a hassle. Uh, it inspects cases in a set to see whether they fall into clusters or groups that share certain patterns. And the last one is meta-summary, meta synthesis, and meta-ethnography. Meta, uh, the three things, the, these three things make no assumptions about uh, cases at hand are more or less comparable structured in similar ways. And these approaches systematically synthesize interpretation across two or more cases 
even if they were conducted by different researchers with different assumptions and different participant types. Next, next slide. And there is strategy that uh, conducted when we do variable oriented analysis. Researchers often look for terms that cut across cases, case dynamics as such LB pace or underplay. For example, the researcher look at interview about gender equity programs with 25 teachers after can careful inductive coding the researcher located recurring themes such as concern for students activist view of change and barriers to innovation later the researcher also short the teachers into six types based on the configuration of the teams and the last one is strategy during mix start mix analysis which is the uh combination between variable oriented analysis and case oriented analysis uh, at a number of points in the forthcoming methods and display page chapters we can suggest a strategy that might be cost taking comparable cases the researcher write up each of series of cases using a more or less standard set of variables then the researcher use metrics and other displays to analyze each case in depth after each case is well understood the researcher stack the case level is placed in a meta matrix, which is then further condensed, permitting systematic comparison. And the next chapter will be presented by my friend. Okay, next we have chapter five, with, with, which will cover about designing the matrix and network display. Next slide, please. So this chapter actually explains about the fundamental principles for the uh, design and content of two analytic display method, which already have been mentioned before by my friend, which is the matrix and the network, where those two methods are learned in order to help summarize the major data and findings from a study to further analyze or to represent and present the conclusion easier and more effectively. Since sometimes, as we know, the result text from the interview transcript, field notes, or documents are a bit lengthy and messy, so that is not easy to see as a whole. So these two display method is to help uh, organizing the information or, or the data gathered more coherently and clearly. And for qualitative researcher itself, uh, to help them organize their data analysis, they can use a software packages that can develop publishable tables, graphs, and charts, which is called the a CAP test program or the computer assisted qualitative data analysis software, which uh, offer tools that assist with qualitative research, such as transcription analysis, coding and text interpretation, and etc. Other than that, we could also use the basic Microsoft Office programs, such as Word and Excel, which are sufficient enough for most metrics and network displays. Next slide, slide please. And then, uh, of course, uh, in deciding on the deciding on and generating the format for displaying qualitative data are very important first step. So with the template, uh, it's uh, the visual outline of sorts for the data to be filled. So format can be varied as the imagination of the analyst. But here we're just going to focus on these two formats of matrices and network in which matrices uh, are more defined with uh, defined rows and column and network are more uh, uh, with a series of nodes with length which is the lines and arrow between them next slide so this is uh, the example for matrix so as i mentioned before metric is essentially the intersection of two lists set up as rows and columns so it will be easier to see and com uh, and to compare the data as a whole in one page so here the example is a table drawn with Microsoft Word software aimed at to understanding the effect of assistance supplied to a school site. This was a part of a school improvement study that observed how a new project innovation was implemented. Uh, the matrix format calls for the researcher to address five related variables to distinguish two of them according to time, uh, to pull responses, to align some responses along and evaluate scale and to explain the response pattern for each type of assistance source. So here is actually a summarized information from a 30 page of field notes that has been packed into a single page. 
And overall, the matrix is a tabular format that collects and arranges data for easy viewing in one place, permits a detailed analysis, and sets the stage for later cross-case analysis with other comparable cases or sites. Next slide, please. And then here we also have the example for network. As I said before, a network is a collection of nodes or points connected by links or lines that display streams of participant, action, event, and processes. So network lend themselves well to a case-oriented approach that recreates the plot of event over time, as well as showing complex interrelationship between the variable. So they give us uh, the kind of narrative that tend to get chopped up analytically in the matrix in the matrix and they are usually very helpful when you want to focus on multiple variables at the same time for readily analyzable information at a glance so the example here we have the a network model from a study of how high school speech classes influence and affect adolescents and their adult adulthood after graduation. Here, each of the variables are connected with lines and arrows to make it easier to see and explain the relationship or interrelationship between the each variable and how they affect one another. And so network are also very effective uh, for heuristic for higher level analysis, such as discerning causation, analyzing longitudinal trends, and developing hypotheses and theories. Next slide, please. And then uh, when should display format be generated? So analytic display can actually be developed either during, during or after the data collection. They can provide pre preliminary findings about what is happening in the case and suggest leads toward the new data. Later, when the data are more complete, these displays can give the basic material for higher level explanation and give plausible reason for why things are happening as they are. Next slide. And this is how to, uh, we're gonna talk about how to format the matrix template. So there are actually no fixed format for constructing a matrix. Rather, matrix construction is a creative yet systematic task that further your understanding of the content and meaning of your database even before you begin entering the information. Thus, the issue here is uh, not whether you are building a correct matrix, but whether it is a helpful one that will give you reasonable answer to the question you are asking or suggest promising new ways to lay out the data to get answer. And these, uh, given these choices, there are some of these are some of the easiest ways we can take to build an outline or format for matrix display. Uh, so first one, we have to look at uh, our research question and key variables, and think of the data that are will that are or will be available. For this, we can sketch the matrix outline roughly do, using paper uh, and pencil manually, and then we. Next, we can get a. Uh, we should get a colleague uh, to look at uh, our initial format to help us to detect the assumption that we are making and to suggest alternative way to display your data. And then we have to set up the matrix template by using a text program, database management, or check test software, and try to make the display completely readable on your uh, on our own monitor screen or on one printed sheet of paper, if possible. And you have to be able to see it at once. And then you shouldn't try to include more than a dozen or variable in rows of column, row and column, because five or six variable is more than manageable. If you are drawn to a design with a larger number of variables, plan to cluster it or partition them as a meta matrices and in effect regroup the matrix into streams or adjacent families. And then the simplest matrix are organized into dimensions, but uh, we have to also a choice to move to more a complexity if the data demand it by creating partition for meta matrix. And if the matrix is an, or an ordered one, Expect to be, uh, to transpose row and column for a while until you have a satisfactory version. And most text-based software, database management, and chapters program can do this quite easily. And then we also have to always stay open to the idea of adding new rows and columns even late in your analysis in our uh, analysis operation. Then we also have to keep rows and columns detailed enough to accommodate meaningful uh, differentiation in the data 
Jakarta, but not so fine as to bury our un, uh, under indiscriminate detail. And lastly, uh, to keep in mind that any particular research question may require a series of displays. And for example, an in initial partially ordered descriptive matrix may lead to a small summary table and then to a network display. Think, think ahead uh, to this possibility, but allow new matrix forms to emerge as the analysis process. And next. Next slide, please. Okay, next uh, we're going to talk about how to enter matrix and the network data. So generally, the choice of data for display entry must be driven by the particular row and column headings involved or by your definition of network nodes and links. But these seemingly straightforward tasks are critical issue in qualitative data analysis. So the conclusion drawn from a display can never be better than the quality of the data entered. A complete matrix or network may look coherent, plausible, and fascinating, but if the data are poorly collected in the first place or were entered in hasty or veggie way, the conclusion will be questionable. And here are some of the guidelines on how to entry data into a display format. Uh, because even a uh, dense matrix uh, displays only a very small percentage of the available data, there is always a great deal of selection and summarization from the mass of field nodes. So we should be aware of how we make the selection and how we summarize the data down because when uh, when we are not going to throw because we are not going to throw away our field notes so we can always refer back to the full material and then the more information is better than less because having too thin or less cell entries will keep us away from the meaning of the data and then we should be clear about the forms and type of data we want to enter where here we can uh, use a direct quotes, paraphrase, general summary, judgment, ratings, and so on. Then we have to uh, use the quotes and software search function to locate uh, key materials by entering this data is much more easier with text-based software database management or a CACDAF program with a multiple screens because they permit you to retrieve code chunks coded chunks to one screen or region and to select or edit them on one another. And have to keep an explicit record of the decision rule we follow in selecting data chunk for entry uh, because uh, you may delete yourself retrospectively uh, when you forget how you did it so, or shift your decision rules during the process. And then uh, when the, the data are missing or ambiguous uh, or were not asked for a certain respondent, show this uh, explicitly in the display or you should write it uh, if you are a bit missing or ambiguous. And then uh, you shouldn't lock up your format until later in the process because you will need to keep revising it as needed. And then we should be open to using numbers, their quantities or judgment in the form of rating scales or magnitude codes when applicable to the study. And lastly, we have uh, we can get a colleague to review our display along with our decision rules and written out field notes to check the procedural adequacy of our work, of our work. Next slide. And then next we're going to talk about how to make uh, the inference and drawing conclusion from the matrix and network. So the test of any display is what it helps you understand of and how trustworthy that understanding is. Here are some of the guidelines to draw conclusion from the matrix and the network. First one, it's always helpful to start with a quick scan. Uh, by screen, uh, screen analysis or eyeballing down columns and across rows and through network pathway to see what jumps out. Then we can verify, revise, or disconfirm that the impression through a more careful review. Then uh, with any given display, we we'll always have multiple tactic use on it. And the ones we have to use most frequently for drawing first conclusion are noting pattern, themes, making contrast, comparison, clustering, and counting. And then uh, display never speak for themselves because uh, you either uh, to you or to the reader. So accompanying text always is always needed. 
as conclusion form in your mind, always write the text explaining them. Make your conclusion explicit and the process of writing inevitably leads to reformulation, added clarity and ideas for further analysis. And then the first conclusion drawn from a display almost always need to be checked again, written up field notes. And if a conclusion does not ring true at the ground level, when you try it out there, it needs a, a revision. Uh, look at the raw data to guard against this and even better check with your research college and participant themselves when possible. And then any early conclu conclusion typically needs confirmation, checking, and verification. The most frequently used tactic we use are, fo are following up surprises, triangulation, making if then tests, and checking out variable explanation. Then you need to be sure of your descriptive understanding is clear at the individual or within case level first before you try to understand cross case pattern. And lastly, to remember that analysis usually has to be go has to go beyond descriptive summation and reach for, toward explanation. Uh, clarify the conceptual implication of your conclusion, and that is how they tie into your or someone else theory of social behavior. And then next slide. And then lastly, this is uh, for the methods profile. There, there is five. We have description, application, example, analysis, and notes. Uh, where in description, the method is briefly described with reference to its accompanying display. And for the application, uh, in this section, the outlines the but this section outlines the purpose of the method and its recommend uses for the particular research study or goals. An example consists of a study drawn from the co-author co -author previous work to illustrate the display, uh, its design and data entry. And for analysis, is the dis discussion, uh, which is the discussion shift to how the assembled data in the matrix or network were analyzed and interpreted by the researcher. And recommendations are usually are also uh, provided here. And lastly, the notes are uh, consist of supplementar or concluding comments about the method that are offered. And the profile vary in line depending on the complexity of the method. And they are grouped into subcategories within each chapter when appropriate if they share a common purpose. Okay, that is the last for chapter five. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the chapter six, uh, which will cover the methods of exploring. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off by defining the exploration itself. So exploration is a method for documenting progress in the field through variables that stand out and are described in writing in research reports. And specifically, uh, exploratory Exploratory in this chapter refers to uh, methods that are documentary and provisional in their uh, analysis or first draft attempts at making sense of qualitative data. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, normally, uh, exploration is divided into three types, which we are going to discuss one by one uh, later on. Uh, the first one being exploring field work in progress. The second is exploring variables. And uh, the last one is exploring reports in progress. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the first type is exploring field work in progress. So um, exploring field work in progress can be uh, done to see the methods uh, that keeps the researcher from getting overwhelmed by the voluminous uh, accumulation of qualitative data. and. Um, there are six uh, six forms uh, in which exploring field work in progress can be done. Uh, there are uh, they are a data accounting log, a contract summary form, case analysis mapping, interim case summary, partially ordered uh, meta matrix, and explanatory uh, effect matrix. Next slide. Okay, so the first form is uh, data accounting log. So. Uh, a data accounting log is a management method that uh, simply documents on a single form when, when and what types of data have been collected from specific participants and sites. Uh, a data accounting log is highly recommended for all quali 
qualitative studies as good uh, record keeping and management, particu particularly for those with large numbers of participants or sites. Next. Okay, so here is uh, the example of data accounting log. So uh, a scan of the form shows both the data collection in progress and towards a study's end. Uh, so uh, reflection on the log might suggest additional forms of data needed or that could be collected. So this uh, uh, data accounting log uh, is usually attached to uh, a context summary form, which will be discussed later on and used in planning and next steps in data collection. The log can also serve as an auditor, auditor's uh, reference or as an appendix to a technical re uh, report. Next slide. Okay, uh, the first form, uh, the second form uh, is the context summary form, uh, which is a one page document with some focusing focusing or summarizing questions about a particular field contact. The field worker reviews the written up field notes and answers each question brief, briefly to develop an overall summary of the, of the main points in the contact. Uh, next slide. Okay, and here is the here is an example of the context summary form. Uh, so the con uh, context summary form is a rapid practical way to do first run data co condensation without losing any of the basic information to which it refers. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, next on. Um, we're gonna see uh, the questions will we, we uh, that will get to the essence of the data set. So here are the here are some of the possibilities. First one is uh, what people, events, or situations were involved. Uh, the second is what were the main themes or issues in the contact. The third is which uh, research questions and which variables in the initial framework did the contact bear on on most centrally. The fourth is uh, what new assertions propos pro propositions hypothesis, speculations, or hunches about the field situations were suggested by the contract, by the contact. And the last one is where should the field worker place most energy during the next contact and what kinds of information should be sought. Um, the field out contact summary form can be used in several ways. The first one is to guide uh, planning for the next contact. Uh, the second is to reorient yourself to the contact when Written, returning to the right up. Um, it also helps with the coordination wh when more than one field worker is involved in the study. It also helps with further data analysis that is the summary forms for a number of contacts ca can themselves be coded and analyzed. And uh, lastly, it helps to suggest new or revised codes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the third form is uh, the case analysis meeting. So at a case analysis meeting, the field worker most conversant with a case meets with one or more people to summarize the current status of the case. The meeting is guided by a series of prepared questions and notes are taken on answers to question as the meeting progresses. Case analysis meetings are good devices for rapid retrieval of impressions and hate notes uh, and for forming preliminary descriptive and inferential generalizations. Uh, the back and forth interaction among colleagues helps uh, keep the field worker honest. Uh, next slide. So here is uh, an example of case uh, analysis meeting form. So in using the form, uh, the meeting can begin profitably with the most involved field workers uh, launching a disc a discussion of item one, main themes, and others ask questions for clarification. The recorder follows the discussions uh, and taking notes uh, under the heading and asking for further clarification if, if needed. Next slide. Uh, the fourth uh, form is the in interim case summary. So interim case summary is a provisional product of varying uh, length that is the first attempt to derive a coherent 
overall account of the case, a synthesis of what the researcher knows about the case and uh, what may remain to be found out. It presents uh, a review of the findings, a careful look at the quality of the data supporting them, and the agenda for the next waves of data collection. Next. So here is an example of interim case uh, summary. So it presents the table of contents given to each researcher in, in the school improvement study as an outline for the interim case summary. The, in, uh, the interim case summary is helpful. Exchanging interim summaries with columns, a colleagues makes them up to date and the exchange is a good occasion to subject your emerging constructs or recurrent themes to a critical review. Uh, the most difficult part seems to be accepting the fact that interim summaries are interim and likely to be incomplete, rapidly written and fragmented. To do them well would require upward of a week, which is too much time proportionate to the yield. Next slide. Okay, the next form is partially ordered metametrics. So metametrices are uh, master charts assembling descriptive data from each of several cases in a standard format. The simplest form is a juxtaposition uh, of all the single case displays onto one large chart. The basic uh, principle is inclusion of all relevant condensed data. From there, you usually move to partition the data further and cluster the data that fold together so that contrast between sets of cases on variables of interest can become clearer. A metamatrix is the first exploratory deep dive into cross case analysis to see what the general te territory looks, looks like. Uh, next slide. Um, and here is the example of the partially ordered uh, metamatrix. You now have uh, NCAS level displays comparable with the ones entered in, uh, in display 610. If there are no more than a dozen cases or so, and if the displays are no more complex than these examples, the data can probably all go into one composite uh, partially ordered metamatrix. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the last form uh, is explanatory effects metrics. An explanatory effect metrics is a, is a broad brush stroke chart that serves as an expl exploratory first step to answer why certain outcomes were achieved and what caused them, either generally or specifically. An explanatory effects metrics helps uh, clarify a domain in conceptual terms. It is a useful first cut exploration, beginning to trace back and forward the emerging threats of uh, causation. Next slide. Okay, so here is uh, an example of explanatory effect, uh, effects matrix. So uh, here the researcher entered uh, quotes and paraphrases aiming to get at the essence of the interview uh, material appropriate for each cell. In the last column, the researcher adds his own uh, general explanation for each row story. Next slide. Okay, so uh, the second part of um, the exploration in uh, qualitative data analysis is exploring uh, exploring variables. Sorry, uh, there there are some errors. So exploring variables uh, looks at those constituent elements of the data corpus to examine their properties, dimensions, and overall qualities. Uh, so there are uh, four forms to explore the variables. The first one is a checklist matrix. The second is a contract uh, analytic summary table. The third one is a contrast table. And the fourth, and the last one is a two variable case order ma matrix. Next slide. So the first form is a checklist matrix, is a, uh, is a format for analyzing field data on a major variable or general domain of interest. Uh, the basic uh, principle is that the matrix includes several components of a single co coherent variable, though it does not necessarily order the components. Checklist matrices are good when you are exploring a new domain. 
if you have some uh, rough ideas about some key variables and some first components of it, you can begin and then amplify the displays as you learn more. Next slide. So uh, here is an example of a checklist matrix. Uh, the rows are drawn from various components of the uh, implementation plan and the supporting conditions mentioned in the research questions. There is no effort to sort or order the components at this point, but we believe that a, a preparedness might well differ for, you, uh, for users of the new program and, and administrators. So the columns ref reflect that distinction. Uh, next. Okay, so uh, the uh, the second form uh, for the second part is the the a content analytic summary table. So uh, it is a matrix that display uh, that uh, batches or brings together all, all related and pertinent uh, data from multiple cases into a single form for initial or exploratory analysis. One of the first tasks in moving from a single case to a cross case analysis is de determining how uh, many cases share similar characteristics. Quite simply, you take the original matrix used for the single cases and generate a meta matrix that contains all of the condensed data. When the same uh, characteristics appears in more than one case, this can be noted num uh, numerically next to the characteristics. Uh, next slide. So here uh, is an example of a content analytics summary table from the school improvement study. So uh, the uh, Miles and Huberman wanted to document two types of changes that is observed. The first one is a uh, transitory and the second one is durable. And they subdivided each type of change further into two more forms, those seen within the innovation itself and those observed in the organization as a whole. Again, they uh, subdivided their observations of uh, transitory and durable changes even further into three types of change, structural, procedural, and climate. Uh, next slide. Uh, the third form of the uh, variable exploration is contrast table. So uh, contrast table uh, deliberately brings together a range of representative extremes, exemplars, and or outliers from cases into one table to explore selected variables of interest among them. When you try to understand the meaning of a general variable, perhaps an important outcome for a study and how it plays itself out, out across different cases, the contrast table is a useful exploratory device. Next slide. And here is uh, an example of, um, of three school sites whose program changes were assessed as high, low, and negative three extremes. These three, con these three contrast contrasting schools are then examined for their uh, aspects of users change, such as technical mastery, ener energy investment, and so on. Also, researchers assess through appropriate magnitude codes such as high, slow, rapid, high than, high than low, and so on. Next slide. And the last form is two variables case ordered ma uh, matrix. So, a two variable case order uh, matrix generally orders cases carefully by rows on a well known variable, then by columns that can include several aspects of, of a less well known variables to explore po a possible in interrelationships. This method can be used to solve cases when one portion of a research uh, puzzle has been completed, but another portion still remains a mystery, or when several cases have been initially grouped together according. Uh, to some commonality, but now need further analysis to see uh, if even more commonalities exist among them uh, and between them. Uh, next slide. And here is the example of the two variable case order matrix. So this table uh, illustrates uh, 12 schools cases that have been uh, vertically classified by row according to a researcher perceived practice stabilization. Uh, ranging from high to moderate high to moderate low. Uh, the rows include the vari variable that was already investigated and set. Uh, the columns reflect the variables yet to be explored. Columns two and three include additional magnitude codes uh, attributed to the cases with column four listing prim primarily, 
factors that may contribute to the school's like likelihood of program continuations. Continuance. The, the analyst wanted to know how user, users' attitudes and the likelihood of continued use uh, may in relate with the prime actors. Next slide. Uh, next, we'll go on in the, to the exploring reports and program. Uh, we have two forms in, uh, in exploring reports and progress. Uh, first is pre-structured case, which is a template for successive drafts of a report. And then, we have, uh, and then the second is sequential analysis, uh, which show how successive studies built on previous ones to develop cumulative findings. Uh, next slide. We'll begin on the first uh, is, uh, we'll, we'll begin in the pre-structured case. Uh, as we mentioned before, pre-structure case is an outline. Uh, assuming that the researchers has established an explicit conceptual framework, a rather precise set of research questions, and a clearly defined sampling plan, the pre-structured case begins with a case outline developed before any data any da data are collected. The outline will later include detailed data displays, as well as the narrative section accompanying the uh, here are the example of uh, restructure case outline, the abbreviated version. This uh, outline or this template will be uh, bring into the if every every observation that we will conduct. Next slide. The idea of using this uh, restructure case uh, method is about uh, time efficiency. In a study where time is limited and research questions are well specified, the pre structure case is a way to focus on streamlined data collection and analysis that are quick and clean and will more likely provide trustworthy res results. Uh, this, met this method can take on more importance in multiple case studies where comparability across case is critical for more warranted conclusion. Uh, Let's take a look for uh, an example of pre-structure case in a study of reform process in a city urban high school conducted by a staff of five researchers, Louis and Miles at 19 and 1990. The team developed a detailed conceptual framework and a set of 14 detailed research questions. Uh, with the research question in hand, we can put together a clearly specified outline, just like uh, as an example from the last slide, uh, yeah, from the last slide. Next, this method also can be used a different way, uh, because time norm is time normally is limited when less method, uh, when the method is used. For example, uh, the two studies, uh, the two research question from the last uh, Lewis research, uh, two from the fourteen research question is one what better problems and dilemmas were encountered during planning and two what management and coping strategies were employed to deal with the barriers uh, we want to we want a good sample of the following uh, key actors key events and core processes given the limited time it's also useful to plan a sequence approach to a data collection uh, so we can choose which research question will be focused on during successive visits or uh, in every visit we'll, uh, we will directly focus on these two research questions from a total of 14 research questions. Next. So with the outline clearly in mind, the researcher, the researcher begins the first round of data collection. The raw field nodes are cut without being transformed into write-ups. The researcher reviews that the code field nodes and enter that data directly into displays and writing accompanying the analytic text that is the conclusion drawn from the display data. This sounds fim uh, similar to the usual method that we use to reporting um, uh, progress. Uh, but as we can see on the display uh, below, 
uh, the differences between the usual method and the pre-structured case that we are going to uh, we, that we are uh, that we are using here is uh, can be seen in this uh, display in the usual method we start with a field nodes or we start going to uh, the field and write up coding uh, and then display data create a conclusion and then we write an outline about uh, the the field notes the, the field observation that uh, we have conducted uh, and then the outline become a report but in this pre structured case we are started with an outline we all we have already have an out outline before uh, conducting before starting the uh, field observatory and uh, writing a field notes and then uh, uh, without being transformed into write ups uh, we directly code it, coding it and display data and take a, and take it a conclusion and, uh, when we going to the second field notes or the third and the fourth until it's done uh, we have we we are using the same outline and then uh, from the outline that we have uh, been filled uh, we are writing the report this uh, this method will 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 cut the will, will make the time uh, more short and efficient uh, but this display also points the also point the major weakness of the pre structure case which is coding is done directly from field notes not from a public write up and is uh, make our our uh, yeah, our data uh, much less subject to critique and refinement but uh, maybe at the same time it's also more uh, more objective next uh, the second one is sequential analysis a uh, sequential analysis is not uh, necessarily a specific set of methods or something that can be displayed but an intentional iteration of additional data collection and reanalysis to ensure a more robust set of findings and or to build on the full cycle of interim findings for future research each wave of data collection leads to progressively more more smaller clustering and analysis uh, a single interim analysis is real, rarely enough. The first interim analysis should not uh, only point to improve data collection, but also lead to successfully deeper, fuller waves of analysis by swimming back to coding, memoing, and assertion and proposition development as more detailed. Better quality the data become available, and your cognitive map of the case gets richer and more powerful. Next slide. Uh, let's take a look from uh, for an example McPhee, McPhee at 2001 and a team of research colleges uh, conduct a series of separate qualitative studies from 1997 to 2001 that examined that examine adolescent tobacco use uh, the first exploratory study at 1997 uh, investigated teenage smoking at one particular high school site. Uh, the result from the first study raised an, an interesting question. Why didn't school in schools enforce their no smoking policies? The research team uh, projected a next year, pro uh, next year project uh, to answer that question. So McPhee and, and colleges at 2001 has conducted the second study uh, uh, which driven by the most puzzling observation generated from this first study by the world. The team interviewed adolescents and adults and reported the result. Uh, we discovered that administrators found rules difficult to enforce because of the large number of smokers and whatever the result uh, that they that they find. Uh, this is the example of using the uh, sequential analysis uh, sequential analysis method. Next. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, the last uh, material for today.
and then we are moving into our research progress uh, that uh, titled the effects of internship and soft skill toward university students academic achievement uh, next slide. until today uh, we all uh, have been uh, doing an interview uh, with the uh, with the sample uh, via virtual meeting uh, the interview was conducted via a virtual zoom uh, zoom meeting uh, and the interview this interview process is expected to be completed uh, this week uh, thank you uh, that's all from us okay thank you uh, for a uh, group for your presentation so uh, qualitative data analysis is very important because it's uh, the next step after data collection and without a sound uh, data analysis the collected data will only be raw data without useful insights so it's very important to process the raw data and transform it into an, a useful uh, information uh, and often often the case this part is uh, the most confusing and also the most time consuming due to the variety of ways of process and the non-linear the non-linear uh, way of analyzing the data so different with uh, quantitative data analysis the qualitative there's no there's no there is there are no software that automates 100% of the data of the analysis. So even with assisting software with, with CACDES, you still have to do uh, some of the legwork, some, some of the manual work of uh, making the, creating meaning from the data. And um, so basically I'm sure all of you have lots of questions about this topic. So before I give my material, I'll open a Q&A session for group two. I'll limit the session to just three questions. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question for group two. No question? No question, really? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'll just give my materials and hopefully uh, you can perhaps digest it later. So I'll, I'm recording this session and I'll post this session on the mass platform. I've also put uh, a couple of uh, materials, uh, my, my own slide and also a couple of uh, YouTube videos on mass that I'm sure will be beneficial for understanding about uh, the qualitative data analysis. If, and if I might say so, this, this one meeting, I think this is one of the uh, most crucial, crucial uh, topic for the whole semester for this, for this course. So it's, um, it's, it's very cramped. So three full chapter in one, in one session. So, uh, so, Please uh, study the materials posted uh, on Amas, and if you have question, uh, you can ask it uh, to me uh, next week. Okay, um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, I I won't repeat what's already been presented. I'm just filling the blanks here, so. Uh, um, I think this is one of the important tips for data analysis. Before you're doing the data analysis, first you have to prepare the data. So uh, if you are doing interviews, pre, uh, you need to transcribe the interviews into verbatim transcript. So uh, don't, don't code from video or audio recording directly because that won't be, that will be difficult, very difficult to do, but Okay, uh, wait, I'm having a technical errors. 
Okay, so let me check. So basically, prepare the verbatim transcript first, and if you're uh, analyzing documents, photos, and other materials, organize them into chrono chronological order, and prepare field notes if you have field notes uh, written about the document, about the photos, and, and all. Make sure they are put in in a, in, a, in the same folder as the the main uh, data source. Okay, and um, the next one is the next tips is to familiarize yourself with the data. So you've you've uh, you've heard about all of the all of the things that you can do with the uh, the, the the raw data, the, all of the coding, all of the uh, making displays and all all of them. Uh, okay, all of them won't be effective 100% if you are not familiar with the data. So, because the interviewer, sorry, because the, if the researcher is the main tool of analysis for qualitative uh, research. So basically, in order to get a good conclusion, the researchers must be very familiar with the data. So for example, for example, my own uh, qualitative research, I had to read 4,000 user comment over and over, I think more, more than 10 times, just to get familiar, just to get myself familiar with the data, with the teams. Then I can begin doing the coding, doing the uh, rearranging, identifying patterns and so forth. All of them can only be done after I'm familiar with the data. So you need to read the transcripts again and again, and then some more, basically, until you are really fed up with, with the data, and, until you are really familiarized, you are really familiar uh, with what's uh, in the data, uh, and also reread your field notes that you've written during the data collection or during the interviews, and then uh, then you can begin the data analysis. Uh, based on Miles and Huberman, uh, so basically uh, there are three steps of data analysis, which basically is covered in this uh, session. The first part is data reduction, which is uh, in a sense converting the data, the field notes, the, in, the interview uh, transcript into codes into smaller chunks of information for further processing. Basically, it's difficult to process whole text, whole narrative of interviews. So it's it's easier to process uh, the the basic the basic meaning behind all of the text. So sometimes people says a lot of things, but what they mean is perhaps something uh something a uh, basics inside all of the, those words so uh in the data reduction part you have to boil down the text into the important parts of it and 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 make codes based on those uh data reduction okay so this is the data reduction is a uh, process of selection focusing extracting so this is basically coding but be careful in reducing data considered unimportant. Sometimes data considered unimportant within the first cycle becomes important in the next cycle. So uh, you, you have to understand that qualitative data analysis cannot be done in just one cycle. It must be done over and over across multiple cycles until you get data saturation, until adding another cycle doesn't add more insight, more information to the data analysis. So be careful in reducing data. However, you need to do data reduction. You have to do data reduction, but be careful when you are doing data reduction because you don't want to accidentally uh, erase uh, important information because you think it to be unimportant. The next part is data display. In this case, you can make a, a, an interview matrix or a network model, basically anything that helps you to process to explore the data. So you want to explore the data to make preliminary conclusion, but 
in order to do so, you have to display the data. So basically, after you've done the coding, you have to rearrange the code somehow to make it easy for you to make conclusion. So this is uh, the example coding matrix. Uh, my grandmother, blah, 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 blah. And then there's, uh, there's an open code, Excel code, and there's themes. I will explain. Uh, I think it's already been explained, open code and Excel codes in, 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 in the, by the presenter. Uh, and this is one example of data display. There are lots of ways to, to analyze the data, to, to display the data. One of the most pop popular one is word, by doing word clouds. So I think it's one, a good tip for you to try make word clouds out of your interview uh, transcript. But of course, you have to be selective, uh, uh, eliminate nonsense word or fill, filler words. Okay, in Indonesia, there are lots of filler words that you need to uh, remove. Okay, in Indonesian, so in, in, in Indonesian language, in Bahasa Indonesia, there's usually lots of filler words. But even in English, there are filler words that needs to be removed to get the, the meaning. But basically, this is one easy way to uh, summarize. Uh, the data and make it easy for you to to take a preliminary conclusion uh, and you, you make preliminary conclusion uh, based on the current data displayed and you compare it with previous uh, uh, previous proposition and additional new information and you revise it over and over until you are satisfied with the conclusion and you stop doing uh, data collection, you stop doing data analysis, you, you, you uh, begin writing for the report. So that's, that's the, the, the cyclical process of data anal analysis for qualitative research. So it's, it's not straightforward, it's not linear, it's very complicated, okay, but the result can be very satisfying. So it's, it's much more uh, you can get a lot, a lot more insight than simply uh, doing a survey and doing a, a, a statistical analysis with SPSS, EViews, or something. Okay, I'll skip this. I'll skip this, and I've, I'll post this on a mass. You, you can read it by yourself. So basically, this is a way of organizing data, organizing code into meaningful pattern, into meaningful structure. So you structure the data, the code into actual code and then into a, an overarching theme. So in this case, all the coding can be categorized into several actual code and then out of the actual code, you can get the overall overarching theme that summarize the entire uh, code. And this is the usually it's called the, the team, or, or, and it's possible to have a global team and sub teams and so forth. Uh, and also, there's there are sentiments that's possible. For example, a positive sentiment uh, toward a phenomenon; those can consider can, can, can be considered a theme by itself. So uh, you identify the theme by. Uh, identifying the code and then organizing them into a pattern. So this is one alternative code. So this is not a prescriptive, this is not a must. So there are lots of ways for you to organize your data, but one alternative is by doing a, a descriptive uh, thematic analysis or domain analysis. So basically you break down a, a a complex phenomenon into components. For example, we have one phenomenon and we break it into three components, domain one, domain two, domain three, and we, we further break down the domains into subdomains until we get, we get the object. So uh, the objects are code you, 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 you obtain from the interview. So you can uh, identify, so you can identify uh, the phenomenon by organizing the code and the phenomenon should be emergent. So you, you don't you don't begin with the phenomenon, but you begin with the 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 uh, the, the object of the interview, the object of the study. 
and then you categorize it uh, and uh, into subdomain, domain, and then you get the phenomenon. So sometimes the, ph the phenomenon might be different from your initial proposal. That's fine. That's completely fine. So uh, I, I won't mind if the final uh, conclusion uh, might be different from what's in the proposal because that is uh, basically qualitative research. It's not like quantitative where your proposal must uh, fit, must be, uh, must, uh, must continue into the into the final report. So, uh, in qualitative research, things happen, uh, unexpected things happen. So sometimes your initial proposition might be obsolete, might be uh, might be irrelevant. So you 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 can and you should change your theoretical framework if that is the case so uh what for for example for example my own uh my own uh experience in doing qualitative i begin uh, with the assumption of plant behavior so I'm, I'm doing uh qualitative research on in-app purchase behavior for mobile gamers so i want to understand why some mobile gamers spend money on uh, on their mobile games for in-app purchase, but I use the framework of plan behavior. Once I've done my qualitative research, I found out that that is not the case. Plan behavior is not uh, not how people spend money on in-app purchase on, in mobile games, especially. So I change my my perspective i changed my theory i scrapped a lot of a lot of work that i've done on planned behavior and i constructed a new uh, perspective a new phenomenon based on impulsive and um uh impulsive and compulsive so impulsive and uh, compulsive somewhat addictive uh model of behavior so that's that's my my take, my own experience in doing qualitative research. Okay, the second alternative uh, coding process is explanatory. So you can frame your uh, data, you can frame your code into antecedent and consequences. So you can arrange your codes around the phenomenon. Some of them can be classified as the cause. Uh, for example, uh um lockdown lockdown stress or, or lockdown uh negative emotion du during lockdown and then you can identify the uh, the the code that indicates the cause of the phenomenon what what makes people uh have negative emotion during the lockdown loneliness stress uh, whatever so and then the some some of the code can be uh framed as the consequence of the phenomenon so what what is the effect of the of the neg negative emotion experience during lockdown for example uh, suicidal uh, tendencies uh, worsening performance uh, antisocial behavior worsening health and so forth so that those those can be those can be uh, can be framed uh, as antecedent and consequence. This is another alternative, and I think this is an easier an easier frame for you to to uh, to summarize your uh, your own quality research. So I I think it's better for you to adopt either this one, describing a phenomenon by breaking it down into component and subcomponent. Or describing the phenomenon, or explaining the phenomenon as antecedent and consequence of the phenomenon. This is uh, two ways for you to to frame your findings and write the case study based on those findings. Okay, I think that is uh, that is all for me. It's already for. Uh, PM. Okay, I'll move to uh, breakout session. So I'll
I'll make the three breakout session. I'll let you choose your own room. So group one, join room one. Group two, join room two. Group three, join room three. Please uh, um, uh, join the respective uh, breakout room. Uh, myself and the assistant, um, uh, Faisha, I think. Well, Faisha uh, will join you. Oh, but Faisha is no longer here. <laughs> okay, we'll join you uh, shortly. So please join your respective uh, breakout session. Sir, I haven't been able to join the breakout room. There isn't an option in my Zoom meeting. I'm sorry, sir. I think you're muting your microphone. Okay, sorry. Hi, Irina. Which group are you? I'm in group two. Group two. Okay, I'll sign it. Okay. You should be able to join now. I think I haven't been assigned to, sir. Okay, which group are you? Wait. Uh, one. Group group one. one. Sir, I, I was mistaken. I, I'm group one too, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, move it. I'll move you to group one. Okay. Okay, you can join now. Okay, sir. Kenapa ya? Yes, okay, so how's how's the progress of your uh, final assignment? Have you begin yes. interviewing? We we haven't begun interviewing, but we we uh, haven't actually, sir. Okay, uh, that's fine. Try to at least interview uh, one person by next week. So who who is uh, who are who are the people that you can interview? Who who are your Planning to interview students. We're planning to interview yeah. final and junior okay. ultimate uh, students. Okay, you should be able to interview one of your friends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, okay. You you don't uh, you shouldn't interview them uh, face to face. You can interview them with Zoom or Google Meet like this. So I think uh, that should be. Uh, easier for you rather than meeting them directly because it's still uh, it's still uh, uh, with it within pandemic. So if, if if you really want to get a, a face to face uh, meeting to offline meeting, you you can. But please be make sure you follow the. Yeah, we're, we're we're maybe planning on Zoom interviews. Okay, that's good. I think that's uh, much better. Just, uh, have you got a contact yet? Someone that you have have in mind? Yeah, we actually have. Uh, uh, sir, sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, we actually have uh, two of our friends from okay. Batch 2018, and we're currently looking for Batch 2017. Okay. And actually, we're only interviewing for uh, management students in the February. Okay. We yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you should interview them. And when you're doing the interview, my suggestion is to make the make the most of the time. Okay. Uh, uh, have you prepared the protocol, the interview protocol? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Sir, I have okay. a question. Yes. Uh, uh, is the protocol like we're strictly questioning the interviewees with the protocols, or it's just like based on the protocol, and okay. we can? Okay. The protocols are. More. A rough guideline, so you are you are allowed to deviate from the protocol, but not by much. So, uh, uh, as long as the purpose of the interview is achieved, you can. So it's not 
a structured interview, it's perhaps you should be a, a roughly a semi-structured interview. So you have the protocol, you have the guideline, you uh, follow it uh, as best as you can. But if uh, if uh, there's a benefit to it, you, you can get a further insight. You can uh, you can add more question. You can probe. You can uh, you can rearrange the rearrange the question. Okay, if that helps the flow of the interview, because the flow of the interview is very important. If you disrupt the flow, you might make the the informant uh, less informative. So that's why uh, my suggestion is don't be too strict with the structure of the interview. But as long as you get all of the points in that interview, that's fine. Oh, okay, sir. So we can make adjustment uh, yep. to each the interviewee, sir. Yeah. Okay. But make sure that it's you can compare them. So if you collect one information from one person, then you need to collect them to all of the of all of the people. If, for example, if you miss something, you can ask them for a follow up interview. That's fine. So for example, if you missed one or two questions from one of your friend, uh, you can simply arrange. Can we do another interview, a second interview, to fill out the missing uh, question? Then and that's fine. Oh, okay, sir. So, like, if I have uh, a data from one interview, yes. we can. I have to also have that that same data from the another interview. We, yeah, right? roughly. Uh, yeah. So, so I can compare the data. Yeah, that's data. right. That's right. Okay, sir. Uh, is there a minimum respondent? Um, sir, or... I think five people should be enough. But it's it's. It's not about it's not about the number of people, but it's more about the number of hours in your interview. Okay, uh, so for example, if you interview five people for ten minutes, that's not enough. So you need, you need, I think, the total interview should be uh, roughly uh, three to five hours maximum. So between three hours to five maximum total. So if you interview uh, five people for one hour, that should be maximum. But if you interview uh, for for half an hour, then I think you, you should do six people. Then that's the minimum. You get you get three hours. So between three to five hours, that's my expectation for the interview. Okay, sir. So like, uh, the main point is to have a as thorough as possible. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's not about the number of uh, interview, but it's more about the depth of the information. So uh, rather than interviewing 10 people for half an, an hour, I prefer you interview uh, five people for an hour. Usually that, have, that, that has more depth, but not more than one hour. More than hour, one hour, people get distracted. So you should, if you need to interview for more than one hour, you can break the interview to two sessions. Two session. So uh, one, one hour today and one hour tomorrow, uh, tomorrow that's fine. Okay, sir. Thank you for your insight. Okay. okay so uh, I have a follow-up question uh, about the interview. Do we need to submit like the recording or, or just the transcript? Yes. No. Uh, so I, I need to evaluate the data, the, the, the process. So I need to, so you can simply upload it to Google Drive and send okay. me the link. So I'll, I'll download it from the Google Drive. But uh, in, in the paper, you should include the transcript but i'll ask for the link to the recording also as well okay sir thank you okay oh and yes sir uh, uh we, we want to apologize about the early no worries, state about the presentation. No worries. okay and so, uh, so yeah in next week uh are we what are we presenting sir? okay so your group will present chapter seven and eight um miles huberman so uh, you will take the material for group four in the syllabus so group 10 eh, sorry group three will uh, cover chapter 10 and 11 of the yin book while your group will cover chapter 7 and chapter 8 of the uh, miles huberman book okay that, sir. okay noted sir thank you okay okay, okay. okay. make sure uh, make sure you limit your presentation to 60 minutes including Q&A. So uh, 
uh, uh, the, this group two is uh, actually over the time limit, but that's fine because there's only one presenter. But uh, for next week, please limit your presentation to 60 minutes, including a Q and A. Okay. Okay. So we'll do. Okay. I'll 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 move to the second group now. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hi, Hello. Hi, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. How's your progress? What's the progress? Uh, sir, uh, I want to ask. Yes. So, uh, in our uh, reference journal, actually, uh, uh, actually, we have a kind of different method from our uh, reference journal because in our reference journal, actually, uh, they, they interview uh they interview uh the user of online travel agency uh, okay. using uh some like some framework okay. uh yeah okay so your reference journal use interview and you're using what uh we're uh, actually uh, we also use interview but uh uh we're we plan to interview the the Traveloka employee, uh, not no, the no, no. not the audience. Is that okay? Okay. Um. So. Okay. So if you want, if you if you plan to interview the Traveloka employees, um. So what what is the question? What's the research question? So. Um, I'm just confused because. Um, so your reference, let me check, let me check your proposal first. Mm. Uh, sir, this is the one last Adoption week that you system. asked us to um, ngolah data from Instagram and also okay. oh, yes, yes. Okay. interview the Traveloka employee instead okay. of interviewing the students. Okay, okay, so, um, okay, so if your method is different from the the reference that is fine as long as it um, fits the research objective so what is your research objective and then how you answer it, how you plan to answer it because the, there's no one way of doing of, of answering the question so sometimes there are multiple ways of answering the same question so if you if you interview the Traveloka employees, that is fine. As long as you can connect the findings toward the, the objective of your study. And also about uh, using uh, social media data, that's also fine. That's, uh, that's I, uh, I think that's, uh, I think it's much more recent trend in qualitative research. So compared with, I think interview is quite classic, a pro, classical approach while social media data is much more a contemporary uh, approach, but that is fine. Um, I think you can find a lot of uh, reference for that. Okay, so I don't, I don't mind. I, I have no problem with you uh, collecting the, the data from the M, uh, the travel of employees or collecting uh, social media data, I don't mind as long as you can. Uh, how do I say it? Uh, weave them down or uh, link them down sufficiently to answer the research question. Okay. Is that clear? Hello. Clear. Uh, clear, sir. But uh, uh, in our paper and our reference journal, uh, it was stated that the purpose is to explore consumers' experience. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Consumer experience. Okay. So, okay, you can you can get the consumer experience from the social media data. That is still okay. Uh, okay, but for the Traveloc employees, I think, yes, it's a bit, I think it's a bit, uh, it's a bit different. 
Okay, my suggestion is if you can interview uh, customer or users of social, the the Traveloka users, that will be better. Or if or, or if, if you can't find someone, so perhaps you can find uh, you can. It's okay for you to uh, to get the participant and ask them to. Uh, so for example, you find someone who's who travels a lot, who likes to travel. Okay, perhaps your friend or some or your relative who likes to travel, and ask them to try the Traveloka app, and then interview them as they use the app or that's that's the talk aloud protocol so they they uh, focalize they verbalize their experience while they are exploring they're experiencing an app or a, or a program that's uh, that's uh, a talk around talk aloud protocol so basically, basically they are voicing their experience while they are using the app. So that's, I think that's, uh, can you can do that uh, as an alternative. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, sir, so we combine between um, interviewing the users and social media data, yes. yeah? Yes. Yes. To recap, okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, another one, another thing that uh, for, the, for the interview, for the interview, uh, I expect, uh, because you are doing uh, both social media and uh, and interview, I'll have a less strict requirement for you for the interview. But normally, normally, I expect between three to five hours of interview. That's for the the team without social media. But for you, for your group, uh, if you are using social media as well, I expect at least. Uh, between uh, one and a half hours to uh, three hours of interview. That, okay. So it's not about the number of it's not about the number of interview. It's the length of the interview because usually with longer interview you get a more uh, deeper understanding. So rather than short interviews, rather than lots of short interview, I prefer. Uh, a, a couple of longer interview, but not more than one hour. Usually, if it's if it takes more than one hour, people get tired. So, uh, uh, so usually around fifty of forty-five to one hour for per, uh, for one session. So you up to you. You can divide uh, the session into. Uh, you can divide the, the. For example, you can divide into three people for. Half an hour, then you get one and a half an hour. That is fine. Okay, is there any Sorry, other question? Just, just to clarify, so one and a half until three hours is the total um, yes. interview for all the person that we have interviewed. Yeah? Yes. Per person can be like 30 minutes to yes. 45 minutes. Okay. Yes. For other group, for other group, I, uh, I asked them between three hours to five hours without social media data. But because you need to analyze the social media data as well for your group, I'll cut it down into one and a half to three hours. Uh, expect, so my expectation for the interview will be around that, that, that length in total. Okay. Okay, is there any uh, question? Uh, if not, okay. Uh, for for your group, next week you'll you'll be presenting chapter uh, ten and eleven for the Jin group, right? Hello. Yes, group sir. Three? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so please confirm that for next week. You will present chapter 10 and chapter 11 of the Yin book. Okay. And please limit the presentation time to 60 minutes, including QA. So uh, today, uh, this uh, for this session, because group two is only one group. So 
usually uh, actually I allocate only one hour for per group for one group, but because uh, it's only one uh, group, I let group to to ex exceed the the time limit. But for next week, because there will be two group two groups, <clears throat> please limit the presentation to sixty minutes. Okay. Uh, so, sir, uh, for the next week, we we also present our progression for the project. Yes, yes. Okay. So just just uh, uh, give a, an overall progress. Don't you don't have to be detailed because that's for the final session. The final session. Okay, sir. Just thank you. Tell tell me the brief uh, progress of your your of your uh, assignment. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. I'll. Is there any question? Other question? If not, I'll move to the another uh, breakout room. No, sir. Thank you. Okay. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hello, group two. Hello, Hello sir. Is there any question? Sir. Do you have anything you'd like to ask? For now. I okay. Think not. Okay. What is the progress of your final? Oh, you, you, you've told us. You, you, you've told us. So you, you've had interviews, right? Yes. How many? How many? Yes, we have interviewed. We just have one yesterday. Sir. Okay. Uh, what is? Uh, how long did you interview the that person? About an hour and a half, sir. I wow, think. Wow, that's good. That's good. Uh, okay. So. Uh, overall, uh, I expect the interview to in total to be between three to five hours in total. So it's not about the number of interview, but it's the duration of the interview. So rather than uh, uh, lots of short interview, I prefer long it longer interview. Uh, but usually I try to limit the interview to one hour because if it's more than one hour, usually the people, the, the, the interview, the interviewee gets uh, tired or gets uh, distracted. So, but if you can maintain uh, interest, then that's fine. So, lo usually longer interviews means a more a deeper insight, a better, uh, a better uh, understanding. So, I prefer longer interviews compared with short interviews. So. You've done one and a half hour, so so you you simply need at least another uh, one and a half hours. Okay, so uh, between uh, one so uh, one and a half hours to three and a half hours. So uh, I I I'd limit the 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 interviews to five hours because if you have more than five hours, you'll take longer time to transcribe the interviews and so forth. So uh, just uh, limit yourself to another, or perhaps one or two session between one and a half hours to three and a half hours, and that's fine. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, is there any problem when you're doing yes, sir. So far, I don't think we, uh, we had any problems, sir. Okay, that's good. Okay, so hopefully you'll be ready for the final session, right? Okay, okay sir. Okay, I'll move to the another breakout room. So, but I'll I'll close uh, the room in uh, in two minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir.
Okay, guys. I think we've we've I've, we've closed the okay we've we've closed the breakout uh, session. Okay, we've 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 had a good uh, presentation from group two, and we've had a discussion uh, for the final project assignment. Uh, finally, finally, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, give you an assignment, an assignment that also uh, double as a practice for your data analysis. So check the Amas platform. That's there will be an assignment of coding an existing transcript, and there's also an example of uh, 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 an an interview uh, matrix. So by doing the uh, assignment, you will be prepared. As a, that, that that can be a practice for your own uh, your own um, uh, assignment. Okay, and for next week there will be there will be a session for from group one and group three. I've def, I've divided the divided the 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 assignment. Okay, and. Uh, last but not least, for the final session, uh, I've decided to put it on the 14th of June. So, so that's that will be the last uh, session available for us. So, uh, hopefully, you will have enough time to do the interviews and, most importantly, analyze the data. So, my experience uh, is that for one hour interview, you need three hours to transcribe. So if you've done like uh, three hours interview, then you have to allocate nine hours to transcribe. Uh, and so that's why uh, don't postpone the interview. Don't postpone the data collection because we'll, you will need a lot of time to analyze the data and then write uh, the report. Okay. Is there any question? Uh, if not, oh, uh, I have one more thing. A suggestion for the next uh, for the, for the next session uh, for the presenter. Please prepare and make sure you have good data connection. And also, uh, fellow team members should be prepared to cover their teammates if unexpected things happen. So, for example, if someone have poor connection, uh, uh, it's better for the team member to cover rather than let let the the person have present in poor connection okay uh, that is all from me uh, see you next week thank you very much uh, good afternoon assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you sir waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you sir